Um, people coming and uh, um, it is, let's just get started as people come in. Um, it is my distinct honor to introduce um, our 2016 Center for Health and Risk Communications Distinguished Speaker, Dr. Brett Hassey from NCI. So just a little bit of background information about Dr. Hassey. Um, as many of you know, he is the chief of the National Cancer Institute Health Communication Informatics Research Branch. At NCI, he directs the now very famous um, Health Information National Trends Survey Conference and was the program director for the Centers of Excellence in Cancer Communication Research for about 10 years, right? So that, that lasted for 10 years. In his current assignment, he's working with the President's um, Cancer Panel on their report on connected health and cancer. And I believe the report is already out, so it's very exciting. Um, Dr. Hesse is also a prolific scholar and has authored or co-authored over 170 publications, including books, peer-reviewed journal articles, and book chapters. His co-authored book titled Making Data Talk, Communicating Public Health Data to the Public, Policymakers and the Press was named the Book of the Year by the American Journal of Nursing. He is a fellow of the Society of Behavioral Medicine, a recipient of the Translational Health Communication Scholar Award. That's an award given out by the DC Health Communication Conference every other year. And the latest recipient of the American Psychological Association's Meritorious Research Service Commendation. So, Without further ado, my friends, Dr. So I hooked myself up. Can you hear me okay? This works, right? This is kind of communication technology. It's just, uh, you know, uh, so what I want to talk to you about, in some ways this is a little bit different than what you might have seen or had a chance to talk to uh, people about before, but there's been a lot of activity and excitement at the National Cancer Institute, where I work, uh, after in the State of the Union about a, a year ago, uh, the president announced that uh, the vice president, Joe Biden, would head up a cancer moonshot. And there's, of course, there's this wonderful image where uh, Biden said he didn't know he was going to be directing that, but he was happy to do that, and, and off we've been going. But it's opened up the way we're thinking about cancer, and I want to explain to you a little bit about how communication is going to be sort of vital to some of that. But to do that, whenever I think about communication with respect to any kind of health or disease, I have to begin with the individual. <clears throat> and in this case, this is a colleague of ours who passed away now about two years ago, Jesse Grubin. She was first diagnosed with cancer, I think, in her early 20s. She had three incidences of different cancers and then finally passed away, but uh, spent a lifetime of advocacy on behalf of other people. And she said something once at a conference. She said, look, <clears throat> when I was 20 years old, the millions of dollars of biomedical research into disease that was costing tens of thousands of dollars to treat. And it ultimately relied on the actions of a skinny, weak, scared 20-year-old to have its impact. Because we're going to talk about, with cancer, um, we expect about 595,000 people to die from cancer this year. That rate is going to go up only because uh, the population is growing older. So my generation, the baby boom generation, is getting rare. And when that happens, cancer is a disease of the aging. So we're going to confront it more frequently. We're going to, and most of us have been touched by cancer already. Now the good news is since 1992, 93, the uh, number of age-adjusted deaths from cancer has been decreasing steadily. It's going to be going down about 1% or 2%. So even though more people get diagnosed, more people are surviving and living from cancer, which is very, very good news. By the way, does anyone up here know what happened in 1992, 1993 that accounted for that shift? It's actually an echo effect from all the work done in the 60s and 70s on smokers. Because the biggest killer was lung and bronchus cancer. So that's the biggest proportion, and it finally started to go down for men. Women took a little bit longer, but it started to go down for women as well. Uh, and that 
is a big part of that is communication. And Jessie said something else. She said, uh, for those that do get diagnosed, so those that do have cancer, they're very motivated to try and follow the course of the disease, obviously, as you can imagine, but they're doing it on their own. Especially when they get other chronic conditions, they say they may consult uh, something like 11 physicians in the course of a year, but the doctors behind the scenes aren't talking to each other. I mean, I can't imagine that happening at Amazon or at FedEx, where one point in the supply chain isn't talking to another point in the supply chain. But that is what she said is happening. She's the sole arbiter, she said, of the information that gets handed to her. And this is information that's voluminous, filled with technical information. I'm going to take you back to a movie that was made uh, in antiquity, about 2012. And I want you to hear some of this. Once upon a time, in 2012, people believed their doctors could find the information they needed to take care of them. This was usually not true. In certain parts of Memphis, Shelby County, like just about any city across America, there's a huge disparity in the ability to access just basic primary care, basic medical needs. Well, life on the road is, is good, and, you know, but I tell you, once you do it, you know, for a period of time, Oh, we see the full gamut of healthcare needs here. That least our patients often end up in the hospitals and um, we're having to go to the emergency room for things. Um, we're having to go to other specialists around the city. What if one of us got really, really sick on the road and you know you have to go to a hospital and nobody knows you there, then then what? Some people believe they already have information about them. Some people don't want them to have the information about them that is as a patient. But the reality is in today's world, the primary way that data moves is patient goes and says, I want my information taken to my provider. They get a stack this big, they take it to the provider, and the provider says, that's great, and never looks at it because it's not in a format that works for them, it's not timely, it just doesn't work. Sometimes it was a nuisance when doctors didn't know something. Other times, it was deadly serious. We thought that the surgical oncology grader was monitoring that. I don't know if the outcome would have changed, but it's really hard to look back at the situation and not ask yourself whether or not things could have changed if they knew. In 2008, <laughs> For those of you who were here at the time, the Washington Post had a full-page ad taken out by Kaiser. And in the ad, the top of it said that healthcare is experiencing a crisis in communication. This is what they were talking about. It's the reason why, uh, when the stimulus package was announced, Congress passed the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health, or High Tech Act of 2009. That's why that existed. It was to put electronic health records to wire up for communication into these uh, hospitals and between providers uh, to the hospital and beyond. But as many of you may know, now is the time for communication scientists, public health scientists, medical scientists to figure out how to use these things. This is an entirely new uh, type of environment that we're working in. And it's an environment where there's great opportunity, but it's going to take research and some elbow grease to pull out. Now, I was interested in this whole notion of medical error, the kind that was explained here. So, went to the website for the Joint Commission Accreditation on uh, Healthcare Organizations. And what I want you to notice is the number one source of error is communication error. Of the 17 million errors that occur estimated each year, and we estimate that about 400 to 500,000 die because of those errors, the biggest reason for that happening is communication. So I study communication, and often I would study the tone of people's voice and what they were saying to each other. What this struck me in the face about is it said the worst communication is the one that never happened. The communication that needed to happen, it needed to be prompted, it didn't happen, someone didn't know that they should have done something. That's the communication that bothers me the most. There are two types of error, though. 
what we think about it. And cancer is an interesting case. Others share some qualities along this way. We've been talking, when we talk about error, we talk about errors of commission. So I, I said the wrong thing to that person and they took the wrong medication. That's an error of commission. In cancer, our biggest threat is, is the error of omission. Someone doesn't show up for that uh, colonoscopy when they need to, or someone doesn't show up to a pap smear. Oops, I'm trying to get the, the direction right. There we go. That's the right, that's the right direction. A colleague of mine, Steve Kaplan and Jane Zappa down in South Carolina, they were doing a lot of studies within healthcare systems, people who had access to healthcare. And by the way, the big change over the past several years is putting prevention into healthcare. You needed the technology to make that happen. That was prelude to all that's happening now is we're reinventing healthcare, reducing costs, and improving uh, how long we live. That's going to be dependent on prevention. So they were checking out all the places where batons drop. And, and part of what they found is they were looking at people who were presenting with late stage cervical cancer down in South Carolina. No one should be dying from late stage cervical cancer in this country today. We know how to detect it early. We even know how to vaccinate against it right now. No one should be dying from it. But people were dying from it because they're showing in late. They wanted to know why. What was the reason why? And the reason why was they just simply missed their pap smear and no one reminded them. No one said, look, you know, things were changing. They heard that in the news. First it was every year, then it was every two years, and every three years. They got, got off cycle and no one bothered to follow them out. Uh, so that's just one place, but there are all sorts of places along the pathway across what we refer to as the uh, continuum of care of cancer, from early risk assessment, from primary prevention, detection, diagnosis, treatment, and then what happens when we have people now and more people, up to about 20 million in a few years, who have survived cancer and are hitting back our primary care facilities. Uh, and, and we need to be sure that if they have any late stage effects, from their chemotherapy, maybe it had a cardiovascular sort of impact, that they're having communication about that. So these are all places where we could drop. I got the direction right. The CEO of the American Cancer Society stepped down a couple of years ago to retirement. And one of the things he mentioned, he said, you know what, we know what kinds of things need to be done to increase the number of people who survive from, uh, from cancer from 350 to 1,000 a day. We know how to do that. We're just not getting that knowledge in place. And that's what keeps me up at night, or the other way to put it is to wake me up in the morning, is because I look at that and I say 650 people we can save if we on the social science side, the, we on the organizational communication side, if we can reconnect healthcare so that people are getting tapped on the shoulder to say, remember your pap smear, getting tapped on the shoulder to say, remember your colonoscopy, if we can do that, then we can start driving up the number of people that we're going to start saving from cancer. That's what it's going to take. So here is this announcement uh, at the State of the Union, and this is where Joe Biden, this is the first time I've seen Paul uh, Ryan and, and Joe Biden actually smile together. <laughs> but Joe Biden says that this is, cancer is an incredibly bipartisan issue on the Hill, and it is. Right now, the 21st Century Cares Act, uh, it had just been passed by the House. That's where a lot of the money for Moonshot will come from. They may not call it Moonshot, maybe we'll call it Trump Shot or something, I don't know. But, uh, it will, uh, the, the activity will go forward. And so at this point, uh, he announced the, the Moonshot. And here it says to cure cancer. Actually, the way that matured is he talked to a lot of people, is he said it this way. He said, oh no, no. The real goal here, we're not going to make any promises to cure. First off, cure is not the best way to beat cancer. The best way to beat cancer is, is first prevention. Take all those people, be sure they never get lung and, and uh, uh, throat cancer to begin with. Uh, and then and second, uh, secondary prevention, uh, that's the other way to do it. But if we can get better care, get that knowledge out to people as our first approach, and then work on cure, and in fact enlist people to help us with cure, what the goal is is to do a decade's worth of advances in cancer prevention, diagnosis, and treatment in five years. It's a double our rate. That's what the Moonshot's about. It's how to double our rate. <clears throat> so the, the question that we're struggling with right now, we have a lot of exciting places to go, is to ask ourselves how can we use communication science to accomplish in five years what would otherwise take 10 years? That's what we're looking at. We'll begin 
Uh, first, with just a revisit, more ancient history, back to 1996 to 2016, the rise of the connected patient. Some may have read this in this room um, by uh, Rice and Cass uh, around the turn of the millennium, where they were looking at people who were going online and looking for information, and once they packed out porn and something else, or whatever it was at the time, Madonna pictures, I don't know, they found out that about half were looking for health information. That was the first time we sort of found that, which was kind of interesting for us. More importantly, I was looking at, I'm a psychologist by training, the number one search term is depression, number two is allergies, number three was cancer. So people were starting to come in, in fact, what was happening is that people were going into doctor's offices, the college's office, loaded down with papers coming from the internet. This was a new kind of communication. Doctors didn't know what to do about this. The American Medical Association in 2001 put out a, uh, it was a, it was a, a news resolution for their patients. They said, whatever you do, don't go online before you talk to your doctor. <laughs> this is what they said in 2001. It scared them so much. <clears throat> now we know just the opposite actually helps out. But because we saw that this was happening, the NCI, National Cancer Institute, declared an extraordinary opportunity in cancer communication. It was a time now to understand how these changes, this revolution that was as big as the Gutenberg revolution, how that might influence the way that we can get that knowledge out to people and actually protect people from the ravages of cancer. The way that our director at the time, Richard Klausner, put it was this. He said, as scientists, we have a much clearer picture of individual risk than ever. But here's the paradox. We know far less about how to communicate those risks than we know about how to calculate them. That's why money went into communication, an important part of the program. And the research being done here is an important part that can contribute to that program. We mentioned the Health Information National Trend Survey. That was launched in 2001 as a way of conducting surveillance on this changing health communication environment. Uh, and, and at the time, we were trying to figure out what the internet was going to do. This is well before mobile took off. This is well before people had electronic health records. Uh, just an example of the kind of stuff we were finding. This was from 2005. We would ask people where they prefer to get health information. And this has been consistent across time. Of course, they say from their health care provider. Trust is up in health care providers. But then we asked people where they went for their health information first. They all go to the internet. That was sort of a big deal for medicine to kind of come to grips with this at the time. And there was some worry that maybe uh, medicine would become obsolete. Now it's just the opposite, and we'll talk more about that in minutes. We were able to track, uh, using geocodes on the survey, the spread from 2003 to 2005 of health information seeking, beginning up in the New England Research and Development Corridor. By the way, that's where you get the word nerd from. I don't know if you knew that. N E R D. See, I thought I'll give you something interesting today. <laughs> <clears throat> so it began up in that uh, New England Research and Development Corridor in health, and then it spread out to the retirement belt and the rest of the country in about two years. Rapid spread of people going online. Some of this was really big during the early days after 9 11, too, when people were storming the gates of the CDC trying to get information about anthrax. We, the funny thing is, we weren't prepared for that in government. Because what they got were some very highly technical documents. And so now the government's been trying to, and other public health institutes have been trying to change that so that we meet people where they live. I mentioned this notion of people trusting in uh, physicians, and that has remained over the course of the internet, by the way. But as we look to where they go for their first course, uh, going to the internet has actually been rising over time. <clears throat> it's becoming more convenient. We also get more confusion, by the way, in what the internet is telling them, which is why they go back to their doctors. So doctors now are becoming the interpreter. Uh, and then we started tracking back in 2002 to 2008 uh, email to communicate with physicians. <clears throat> and that's been going on the rise. And people said that would never happen. <clears throat> We're the only survey at the time to track it. Uh, we were approached by the Healthy People 2020 group to say to see if we could be their source of data on the health communication and technology component of Healthy People 2020. So we have been collecting data relevant to what they said as their goals when it came to using the internet. One of their goals was just to get more people online. We were deathly afraid of digital disparities, of the digital divide. And in fact, here's a track that we do. We come pretty closely to uh, Pew though we're a little bit more conservative because we oversample Spanish and we use a broader uh, sampling frame. 
but you can see here uh, how we've been going up. The goal was set by, by 2007. They wanted to get about 70% of Americans online. We exceeded that. Then they set a goal at about 76%. We're up to about 82, 83 right now. This is in 2012. So we're about right there for penetration today. People are connected and highly connected. This whole notion of what they might be doing online, emailing position, that's been on the rise. We're probably not going to get above about 35% because these are all people. And usually you get motivated to send something to your doctor or call your doctor if you're sick. Or you have something happening in your family. Ordering meds going online. Many here in this room have now been ordering meds, probably through Kaiser and places like that. When we first started tracking this, that was something people thought was crazy. That only happened with uh, Viagra. Uh, keep track of personal health information uh, and people that are wanting to do that. Uh, we're reporting about 30, almost 30 percent, about 27 percent that are keeping track of their personal health information online. And then this happened. Steve Jobs advertised the iPhone. <laughs> And the next thing we knew, uh, even though we were focusing on broadband access through desktop computers, uh, people came up with smartphones and it started driving upwards. We had about as many people reporting that they're using mobile access to get online as they do using computers at home. People are abandoning their cell phone I was step or their landline phone. Uh, I was mentioning to folks here that about half of the country in the latest count from CDC tells us that they uh, they're stopped using their landline phone, using cell phone only. So the communication environment has changed dramatically. That's the context for why two years ago the uh, President's Cancer Panel elected to focus on communication. Now the President's Cancer Panel, the President's Cancer Panel is enabled by the legislature that, in, that enabled the National Cancer Institute. It was the Cancer Act of 1971 that Richard Nixon signed. <clears throat> and it's demanded, it, it required that three people would be drawn at the president's appointed discretion uh, from the broad uh, the, uh, popular field of stakeholders in cancer. And typically we have uh, someone who is well respected in the cancer arena. This time it was Barbara Reimer, who's dean of public health down at Chapel Hill. Owen Witte is a cancer researcher, does prostate cancer down at UCLA. And then Hill Harper. Uh, I think it's uh, in the C CSI, one of the CSIs. He's, a, he's an actor, he's got a JD, and he's a published author. Uh, also is someone who uh, is a cancer survivor. So he, before it was Lance Armstrong, we get someone who's had cancer and can talk to people about it. That's the panel. So they said, let's understand what we can do to bring together these disconnected pieces of the healthcare system. That's connected health to use technology to make that happen, assist with that, and get the right kinds of communications happen. What I want to do is share with you directly from this report the recommendations. This has just come out. We're excited about it coming out. There are a lot of recommendations that go to different uh, funding agencies, so you can see opportunities to do research, if that sort of thing. Uh, but as uh, a general uh, patient in the world today. You also want to be sure that things are happening, so you should be holding our stewards responsible for the work going on. The very first uh, point of uh, emphasis by the panel was back to the Department of Health and Ser Human Services to ensure interoperability. Now there's a term, I don't know, that's a wonky term, I get that. Interoperability means that when you go in and enter your information at your primary care physician's office, that that information gets sent seamlessly over to maybe the hospital or to a specialist office. How often has that been happening? Not so much. Uh, we, in, we wanted the High Tech Act to enable interoperability, but what was happening is that certain market forces, certain uh, very large legacy systems, I won't mention them by name, but sometimes they've been associated with an epic failure, <coughs> Some of these systems uh, said that, you know what, we want to be proprietary about this stuff. We're not going to give you our information. We're going to collect it and just keep it inside. We refer to that as data blocking or information blocking. The Hill has put information blocking on its hit list in the 21st Century Cures Act because the American Society of Clinical Oncology found that there was this data blocking going on. They reported it in a briefing to the Hill. So this has gone all the way up already. Uh, and there is action. So if you find out that your record, by the way, is not being sent someplace, 
then uh, you should let someone know about that because that is undesirable. Once we can do that, once we get interoperability, amazing things can start to happen because we can get data at various levels. We can, we can start monitoring what happens at the practice level, not just on individual patients, but we can find out if we're treating equitably everyone with the best medicine in every single office. We can do that at the, at the uh, hospital level and at the community level. And here is the big piece that not many people know about from the legislative wonky side, but it's huge, to, to borrow to coin a term that someone else has used in the here. It's huge, it's big league. <laughs> and uh, what that is, is that uh, now hospitals and practices are not just responsible for clinical health, but for population health. Their funding under value-based care is going to depend on it. That's the teeth behind prevention within clinical systems. So one of the problems we had in this country, and it happens in other countries as well, is that we often divorce public health from clinical health. So we wouldn't get prevention, and we focus on cure erroneously. Now it's bringing it back together, and it's making it an important requirement. And we'll see how that pans out in a few minutes. But from all these data that are going through through interoperability, we can start evolving more efficient clinical guidelines. We can create better public health policy, data informed public health policy, and we can mine big data for better clinical decision support. Most of what happens in offices right now is kind of art. Not all of it is based on guidelines. We get it right about half the time, according to most of the studies. And we want to make that so we get it right 100% of the time. So these are the pieces that will make that happen. Uh, here's an example of what the American Society of Clinical Oncology is doing to ensure that this, this uh, interoperability influences every single decision that's being made is they're changing their electronic health record to have the same measures across every practice. And then we're emphasizing that we push for standard open API platforms. Well, what the hell is an API? <clears throat> for those of you from computer science, you're familiar with this. Uh, it came from a New England Journal of Medicine article written by Ken Mandel in 2008. And, and what he said in this article, he said, we're thinking wrong about the technology. We can't go in and ask uh, certain or epic systems to modify itself. It's a behemoth that was created originally for accounting purposes and billing purposes, and, and change itself for uh, what we do with clinical practice. That's too hard. We're trying to do that a lot. That doesn't work. He said, consider instead the electronic health record to be more like, I'm going to reach in my pocket and grab, I hope I can. I've got a lot of paper in there. Boy, that's a very 19th century, 20th century. Well, I'm not going to be as impressive just printing this out. Here we go. Mm -hmm. To be more like an iPhone. To be more like an iPad. What do you mean by that? What he meant by that is what Apple did is that they embedded their iOS, their operating system, within the iPads and the iPhones. And then they invited communities to build apps on top of it, and full-blown applications on top of this. This changed the way we thought about how we're going to create a market that delivers usable tools to people. And so Ken Mandel said, why don't we do that, in fact, with medicine? And if we do that, we can create a new ecosystem of applications that are focused for need. Now, we're going to pick this up at the NCI, and we're going to fund people to create these kinds of applications, survivorship plans, for example. We've been doing that up until now on paper. We've learned some things by doing it on paper, but how about if we learn what happens when we take paper and make it live dynamically? What if we turn the electronic health record into a wiki? And so other people, and you can imagine all the questions that have to be asked about that for team science and all this kind of stuff, right? There's a lot of science that needs to go into that, but that's a recommendation from the report is that we ensure that level of interoperability with APIs. Uh, it's happening now quite a bit. One of the reasons, another reason why that is important is because uh, some of the tools that we can start to create could be tools to help individuals live longer by being healthier. So I shared with some folks that uh, Fitbits and, and, and these things, these Apple Watches, were the big Christmas item last year. I don't know how many 
in here got that. Most people got the Fitbits in December and then uh, put them in their drawer about in April because it was hard to play. Uh, but at least it was a pivot toward people really taking an interest in their own health monitoring themselves, and we know from psychology that if we're monitoring and regulating what we're doing, that that feedback is very powerful, and we can compare that to others as well. So we can do something uh, like get these devices, these connected health devices, and we can start bringing them together, not just to inform the individual, but perhaps even to inform the next clinical encounter that we have. We can do something like this. We have in cancer, we have in cardiovascular disease, we have in diabetes, we have another uh, is one of the biggest problems we have is in, in adherence, medication adherence. Uh, it takes a high degree, typically, of health literacy to pay attention to what's on a pill bottle. Uh, we know that for antineoplastics in cancer, that uh, what will happen is that you'll sometimes have to take two doses one day and another dose, a bigger dose the next day. The third day is something entirely different, very complex regimen. And we're doing this all the way from the infusion clinic and you're sick. I mean, how in the world could you possibly adhere to that? So we have, a, among young adults, we have a 60% non-adherence rate. It's horrible. Remember uh, Jesse Bruman at the very beginning? She said, here's this poor 20-year-old sick person. And she's got to be responsible for adhering to this medication. And she'd rather go dancing, is what she said. <laughs> so uh, there's a group that has developed out of the Internet of Things something called the GlowCap. This has now morphed into a very vibrant uh, economy. Uh, it's a product, uh, I think, that's being developed up in Boston. And I've looked at it, it's pretty impressive. And what the GlowCap does is it keeps track of all your regimens programmed by someone else, by your pharmacist. And then it'll beep, it'll glow, and tell you when it's time to take your meds. And it'll send a message to the pharmacist that if you haven't taken your med for a day, because uh, in cancer, these meds are often very uh, expensive then they'll reach back out to the person and get them to re-adhere. And by doing that, uh, this was a, some data I saw about two years ago in, uh, I mean, cardiovascular. They, the intervention group took a 42% adherence rate up to about uh, 92-3%. This is huge. This is gigantic. But what, what are we doing? I'm taking this communication thing in a little bit different way. I'm taking it like an environmental psychologist or a human factors person. I'm saying, let's change the environment around us to nudge behavior. And that's what they're doing. So we talked about that in the report. Uh, these interactions that patients have where they wanted to look at their own medical records. Lance Armstrong, one time, uh, went to his doctor when he was coming out of uh, testicular cancer, and he was in California. He visited another doctor and said, uh, I need to get my records out here, and I'd like to see them. And they wouldn't give him his records. They said they signed a HIPAA. Yeah, the, HIP, the, the Health Insurance Portability Act. Was that legal? Damn straight, it wasn't. Uh, he took them to court, and he got their records. Since then, the department has made it clear to every physician if someone comes in to you and says, I want my record, and I want it electronically, they got to give it to you. I want it on paper, they got to give it to you. You have a right. This is your data. <coughs> this is where I usually show an old Seinfeld episode where Elaine is trying to figure out what's on her health record or medical record. This is a new world that we're in right now, and it's a world of uh, civil rights where you have uh, access to that. How many of you have experienced a nest in your home? Has anyone ever bought a nest? Do you know what nests are? Have you seen them advertised? I've got one. <clears throat> it's kind of fun. It surprised me that it was kind of fun. It came out, they were developed by the Department of Energy because the Department of Energy was trying to figure out how to save money in a community. Think like what we do for population health. They wanted to change behavior of individuals in their homes so that they weren't using as much air conditioning in Texas, for example, is where the pilot study was. And they, they tried all the brochures, all the old communication stuff we used to do, <laughs> and they'd call them up and they'd be nice. And they said, well, let's try something else. Let's see if we can get a smart thermostat that detects when the person leaves and turns it down, lets them even control it, gives them autonomy and control by using their cell phone if they want to turn it back on, get it nice and cool by the time they come home. They did that, and they drove down energy consumption dramatically in these pilot studies in Texas. 
That's why these things are starting to pop up. And you're going to see more and more of these connected things. And we see them in health as a way of allowing you to age in place, allowing you to be supported in your environment, and to nudge safe behaviors. We've got to get some way to protect you if you're on, if you're recuperating, especially in cancer. So we talked a little bit about what we can do in the report uh, with respect to supporting all these behaviors and nudging behaviors. Not only can you get your information, but by God, you have a right to say, you know what, I'm a 60-year-old white male and they called me a 34-year-old uh, female. I think that's wrong. I think we should change that record. I suspect I'm going to get the wrong recommendations if that's in there. This actually happened. Uh, uh, Dave DeBarkhart up in uh, Boston reported that happened to him. So they're trying a lot of pilot studies now to see if we can make these electronic health records a way for patients to perform the QC for us, because these, these data are often uh, dirty. And, and in fact, uh, in one survey, 64% said that's the most useful thing about a PHR. People go online and then correct errors. When I came in and I talked to you, it was I was sick. You made me strip I'm naked when I'm talking to you. And uh, I, for, I forgot to say some things, and I need to get that information to you because it was incorrect on the record. So now we're following up later. So this notion of allowing patients to be QC support is, can be built into the technology. Notice that so far, none of this is really about the technology. It's about nudging the behavior. It's about enabling the communication. All right. Uh, and then uh, another recommendation was to create better tools for clinical trials. We get about a 4% participation rate in clinical trials. It's really low. And again, we've tried the communication things a bunch of times where we talk to people and all that. Where the promise seems to be is in enabling behavior. Uber, for example, has got a pilot study now where to be sure that you show up for appointments, a, a physician can make an Uber call and then Uber will send a car right out to your house and bring you in to the medical appointment or the clinical trial appointment. So a big thing that happened, remember this whole business about APIs I talked about earlier on? The National Cancer Institute, for the first time, released its control over its clinical trials tool, opened up instead APIs, so that innovators can create their own very creative applications that can be used to bring people in to clinical trials. And we think this is going to uh, end up really changing the way that we uh, interact. With our, with our patients. This big experiment, my wife's an OBGYN, and she tells me on a daily basis how horrible it is to use these, use these EHRs. And she said, and you were an advocate of these things, Brad. I can't believe it. And you know, she, I get this on a daily basis. The first version of the EHRs, in fact, were very unfriendly. It was big disruption. What we've experienced so far is more of the disruption, not the solution yet. So we're calling for a special push to support patients and their providers, to support the oncology workforce, especially since we're starting to lose oncologists. People are not experiencing the joy of medicine the way they used to. We need to get systems that are as effective for them as our systems are in getting you to your uh, work through a GPS in your car. So one of the uh, things that we're really pushing on is applying usability studies, and this is big in communication. We do contextual inquiry, we follow people around, see what kinds of things they use, see who they call, and use that preliminary information to inform a redesign of our workflows in the system. So that's a recommendation. We also uh, make a recommendation on what we can do to create brand new interfaces. This is going to take a translation of science and communication and psychology. What does it take? Here's the question. I have 11 providers. That's what Jesse Grimmins said she had when she had multiple comorbidities. What can we do to keep them on the same page? In the world of uh, computer science, we've heard that as computer-supported cooperative work. You may know it as Outlook. Right? That was an invention that was created to help people work together seamlessly and to know where things work. If you go on to FedEx or you go on to Amazon, you know exactly where your record is. How can we do that for every member of the team? This is a special issue that came out of the Journal of Oncology Practice just a few weeks ago that talked about joint cognition as an important area of study that we need to figure out. 
you know, when I talk about cognition, this is borrowed from someone by the name of Don Norman. He's a design expert from California. He has a lab. He's a cognitive scientist from UCSD. But he was uh, <coughs> a vice president of Apple Computer for a number of years. And he said, look, people operate with knowledge in the head and knowledge in the world. And we have to make the knowledge in the world better to support the knowledge in the head. Because we can't fold all this information up here anymore, especially as we get into something like precision medicine. All right. Fourth recommendation, bolster public access. The FCC, we reached out to the Federal Communication Com uh, Commission because we were making recommendations for them that we explore the notion that connectivity should be a right in this country and should not be denied anyone. And so they're pushing on subsidies. They're also pushing on demonstration projects. The, what we've heard is they have $400 million that they can use per year on demonstration projects. They want to use some of it on connected health but waiting for good proposals. What they want to do is they want to show folks that, look, we have someone who may be going to MD Anderson in Houston, Texas, but they've moved, they've come in from Oklahoma, which is common. They're three hours away. Let's see if we can use telemedicine and show what happened when we get better connectivity to support that health case and see if we get better health outcomes. So those of you who do research in that area might want to think a little bit about how to do that. Uh, we also want to be sure that providers have better access. Um, we struggle in rural communities. This was, I was just down in North Carolina this last week. And they're working on some projects to get uh, a number of their people online so that information is flowing back and forth so we get that network of information to address the communication crisis. Uh, the, uh, we've talked a little bit about how data can come in and can inform us through big data. There is a push right now on creating a learning oncology care system. Uh, and we want to support that. We have a lot of work going around that. We do a big surveillance tool right now called this, the, uh, 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 what's it called, uh, SEER, Surveillance Epidemiology <coughs> and Air Results Study. And SEER typically just takes information from, uh, from uh, registries, but they're working now on getting information more directly from electronic health records and more directly from individuals through patient-generated health data so we can start monitoring people as they get diagnosed with cancer. We don't have to wait until 20 years later. And people have been telling us that, that they want to participate in all of this research. So we want to make that happen. And then finally, uh, we're pushing for what it takes to get uh, data integration. We're doing a study right now where we've got 15 centers from around the country, cancer centers, who are taking our HINTS data and intertwining it at the local level. They're administering the HINTS at the local level. They're taking the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, the National Health Interview Survey. They're collecting all this information on their community because they're responsible for populations now. And they're turning it into action. So the new role is data integration. Finally. As we kind of conclude the record, uh, there are three research areas we identified as being the most important. This is where NCI will put some of its money over the next year. So those of you, again, want to come into us. One is to understand the notion of effective teamwork. What does it take to address the crisis of care in teamwork? Second is to identify strategies for engaging individuals. And this is just behavior support, behavioral maintenance, behavioral uh, change and just getting, allowing people to be very engaged with what they do. And then finally, developing ways of using connected devices uh, to uh, better support the clinical encounter. Those are the main areas. I want to go back to the moonshot. These are all accelerators for the moonshot. And what I want to do is I just want to show you some components of the moonshot and how it kind of brings all this together. A report came out about uh, three weeks ago called the Blue Ribbon Panel Report. And in that report, we had about 10 different recommendations for what we can do uh, on the moonshot. Everything from developing a 3D cancer atlas, expanding use of uh, proven prevention and early detection strategy. All that's important. You can read about it in the report. But this is the one that's interesting. The very first says we should establish a network for direct patient involvement. Let's hear them talk about that just a little bit. I think today the patient is front and center. This is about their needs. They're the ones that have been suffering the most. Get patients to be actively engaged in the process. In other words, create 
what we call this volunteer army of patients. It's critical to gather as much data as we can with the understanding that they will get information back as the process goes along. So they're going to learn about their cancer and they're going to benchmark it against everybody else's cancer. This moonshot blue ribbon is about all patients. There's no question that all these recommendations are cross-cutting and we'll get to these patients. We've got to have cultural competence so that we can uh, refer to and speak with all individuals and make sure the language is appropriate for that population and thus make it user-friendly so that we are focusing on the patient. How do we design new clinical trials that are appropriate for the population of the United States such that there is equity and availability to patients. Allowing the patients to benefit from cancer research and actually helping the research and helping the medicine. We're in an age now with genomic information that we can really find the molecular signature in a way that we never could. They know that they have diagnosis X or Y, but when you drill down and you tell them what their signature is, they can really be actively engaged in the process of trying to understand what is going to best target their signature. Where can they get an advantage where traditional standard of care therapy may not help them? We've got an opportunity now to show the public that we're making progress and we're coupling science with treatment they're going to keep engaged. I was born the same year the Soviets set up Sputnik, the communication satellite. And one thing I've always recognized as part of the Sputnik generation is that communication has been the key to any kind of technology that we develop. It's the central part. But as we now think about how communication can intersect with these incredibly exciting times on the genomic and the technological side, I want to remember some of the words of Joe Biden as he presented this to the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And that is that if we're going to accelerate progress, make 10 years progress in five years, it's going to require a lot more openness. Open data, we have to share with each other now, a new kind of science, open collaboration, and above all, open minds. So on behalf of all those that uh, will benefit from this work and the work that you guys are doing up here. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions I can help answer? We have about two minutes to take questions, John. Thank you very much. It was very, very informative. In our department, we offer a PhD in communication, but we also offer a master's in interpreting and translation. So our students work in contexts like politics, law, but healthcare is becoming you know, a huge need. So as you think about communication problems, how much energy goes into thinking about the barriers across languages? And in, in this last video, she talked about language, but I think it was about lowering the, the level down to something technical, to something that people can understand in English. But then you have so many Americans and people here who wouldn't be able to understand it. Yeah, yeah. Level. So the HINT survey, we oversample in Spanish so we can get some of the notions of bilingualism versus monolingualism in another language. And we find a big uh, burden between the monolinguals and the bilinguals, a big chasm between the two of them. Uh, one of our studies that we just funded on um, uh, using the HINT survey and other information combined and integrated together is coming out of San Francisco. And what they're doing is they're getting a better sense of language needs in their catchment area because they have a lot of Asian languages, Hmong, Chinese, Vietnamese, all of that. And they need to be sure that the interpreters are in place. So I think this, this, is, this is big. And there's a, there's a big need to get people who can interpret uh, in, uh, uh, from a variety of different languages and be available to hospital systems. There is even room for technological support. I was just reading an announcement yesterday that IBM's Watson is being used to do first-line translation to a multiple, someone may have seen that, multiple different languages. So you know, I think what's happened before, someone comes with a new language, we say, gosh, we can't help them very much, we'll do the best we can. But we have old uh, 20th century medicine, which is reactive and tries to treat everyone as the same kind of person. Under the new medicine, we have to be much more personalized and, 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 and precise. And as we do that, I think we need to really make the language interpretation very, very high up. So, yeah, that would be good in healthcare. We need that desperately. Excellent. Yes? Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm curious, you know, you've been in the 
So a lot of the research I do is on patient engagement, health literacy, yeah. and um, exactly what you talked about here. We have clinics involved, and we have committees of residents involved, and they're all ready to go and engage, and then it gets blocked at the medical institution level. At the C-suite, right? Yeah. So, right. And so, as somebody who gets, you know, funded from federal and state governments who are very much willing to do this, MedStar, and then you have the groundswell, frankly, at the patient level, nobody, I don't really hear a lot of communication about how that middle level is really kind of, like, squeezing those options, you know, health departments, um, you know, county governments, those kinds of things. Any advice or or examples where you've been able to work around those individuals? <laughs> So, I mean, so Kaiser is a pretty good example because they're an integrated system, payer and payee, and they realized they had to get all the layers of the organization together. But we have exactly the problem that you're talking about. Uh, one thing that we did from our end is that uh, we put research dollars on the barrel head to try and address some of this. And we're focusing on multi-level communication. So even the way that we use the fund communication, we sort of contributed to the problem because we said, Oh yeah, make a brochure that one patient can see, or help out with just the clinical encounter, and that's it. Instead, the ones that are successful are those that go across all those levels. You know, and how are you approaching mental management so the office is coordinating their efforts and the workflow is supporting what we just taught people to do down here at the resident level, right? So uh, you, you can look at some of those opportunities if that's a, a research interest for anyone here in the room, uh, and we need more work in that area. But yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Pay attention to what will be happening here. Uh, I think we've got cancer on the run, which is, I think, is good news. Has there been any um, pushback as far as like, individual patients worry about privacy, and does that create any communication challenges or goals? Privacy isn't that fun. <laughs> yeah, people are getting hacked, and we're getting ransomware, and we're getting all of this stuff. Uh, so the answer to that is is nuanced. Uh, patients do tell us what do we know. We know that patients will tell us that for the most part they'll trust um, their providers to keep their data confident. So it's the confidentiality they care about, uh, and they understand there's a risk that anyone can get hacked. So they still use their credit cards, even though that's at a risk. Right? Uh, nevertheless, what we have to do on the system side is we have to be sure that the organization is taking effort to ensure that confidentiality. There was an example with the National Health Service just about a week ago, I think it was, where they were collecting data from patients, so they signed the, um, the away their rights to the data, the you know, called data altruism. But we were told they were told that it was going to be de-identified and that uh, kept confidential and only used for a certain purpose. They discovered that the National Health Service in England was selling it to pharmaceutical companies, and it just was a breach of trust. So they had a backlash <coughs> in a really big way that way, which means that this formula of how we protect privacy and confidentiality is pretty key if we ignore it. We do that There's a really interesting, by the way, kind of MIT um, technological uh, add-on to this. And what they've been trying to make possible, and I think they've been able to do it, is that they'll set a flag in your data when you share it. And if you find out somebody's used it without asking you, they'll reset the flag so no one can use it anymore. And it just shuts off that string. It gives, pay, it gives power back to the patients. I'm kind of a power to the patients. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. I have one more question. Oh, one more question. Um, I, I, I think the word you put out there, nudge, really fascinates me because in communication, we don't usually talk about that. And so the idea of nudging people to certain behavior is based on the assumption that um, that's the only thing they would need to actually take action. Um, but in communication, the way you often start with you know, first, you know, addressing people's risk perception, they're changing their attitudes, and then change their behavior. But by 
you know, kind of focusing on nudge or kind of skipping the, the risk perception attitudes part, to what extent do you think that those sort of initial uh, stages are even important now, given that we have all this technology and getting people going and, you know, if they want to go, don't want to go to the hospital, get them a Uber, you know, they will go. <laughs> but to what extent do you think it is still important to kind of attend to this, you know, changing perceptions and risk perceptions, susceptibility, perceived severity, changing attitudes, yeah. um, you know, given the technology development and how important it is. So when I, when I introduced the word, and the question has to do with this really interesting schism in uh, the, the behavioral sciences on how do you change behavior, do you do it by intervening on the human, or do you do it uh, by intervening on the environment in which the human interacts, right, the system. And the notion of nudge in the book, uh, Cass Sunstein's book, uh, really was, uh, people think about that in behavioral economics. But in behavioral economics, it's not about giving people an incentive. It's usually misperceived that way. It's understanding incentives. It, what it really is trying to explain is where are all the intervention or the target points. And they use this wonderful little acronym for nudge, where they say the first part, N, is for incentives. U is for um, understanding uh, mental maps, which is what we do in risk perception. right? We understand incentives. We understand mental maps. Uh, but it also adds that we uh, think about defaults because right now we have all these defaults in the healthcare system that nudge us away from healthy behavior, right? So this is the reason why the FDA was so successful with tobacco and tobacco cessation. Uh, it went, part of it was the control of the communication coming their way because that was influencing the mental model, but it was also changing the way that people would get their tobacco or their cigarettes and and, um, and and when they could smoke, right? It had to change the actual environment. Uh, it would be to give feedback, these are all human factors concepts, by the way, to expect error, because we're all gonna screw up, and then to structure decision making. That's nudges, that's where the acronym came from. And I would argue they're entirely compatible. Uh, and, but I would argue that it's an error to only focus on one component or the other, you have to think of these things coming together. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to understand the mental model, and I just think of the communications that we do if you give a pamphlet to someone, or if I train a doctor to talk to someone, that what I've done is I've simply uh, taken one part of that environment and I've done an intervention on it. Right? But there are other parts of the environment. And this is that whole notion of the middleman being cut out sometimes in organizations. That's the problem we kept running into. And it's a classic human factors problem. So we did a great job. We have the best residents in the world. <laughs> And then they're in a system where they say, and you've got to see how many patients per hour, and we're not going to let you do this, and we're not going to do that. So that behavior got overwhelmed. So anyway, I, I, it just kind of, I see it as sort of expanding a little bit, the, the, the way we think about it. Yeah, well, that was good. That was, that was good. All right. All right. Now we're done. <laughs>